Welcome to the Business of Doing Business. I'm your host, Dwayne Carey. With 35 years in business and close to 30 ventures across 12 industries, I've seen a lot. Amid the celebrity allure of entrepreneurship, many exceptional entrepreneurs remain shadowed. Here, I team up with these hidden talents to unveil their challenges and successes. Dive in with me to unearth entrepreneurial gems, learn from our experiences, and get educated. All right, let's, uh, relationships, it's the third pillar. Relationships, you know, it's a broad subject, obviously, especially if you're a guy, broad. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, so, <laughs> woo, all right. Um, yeah, I have a buddy who's going through a terrible divorce right now, and he was texting me last night, and I said, uh, you know, it's tough times, it's hard to do. And Pam says, tell him bitches be crazy. No offense out there, bitches. Uh, but <laughs> and my wife said it, so you can blame her, not me. I didn't say it. So I text that to him, and he goes, yeah, it's a good thing they're so good looking. <laughs> <laughs> but no, relationships goes everything from your most intimate relationship with your most intimate partner all the way to your children. You, that's a different intimate relationship to your best friends and inner circle that you have. It's a different intimate relationship or your extended family, I guess, would also be in that in that category to relationship with general friends to relationships out. I, I, I would say to the young people listening, the advantage, there's plenty of advantages, plenty of disadvantages of being 61 years old. So I'm going to tell only the advantage. <laughs> the advantage <laughs> of being 61 years old is this. I lived before cell phones. When I grew up, there was no cell phone. There was no internet. And what a blessing that was that nobody could find me. I can't imagine growing up today where your parents can find you anytime they want to. Oh, that would have been the worst when I was a teenager. <laughs> the only thing I had was they didn't know where I was. I mean, so. Well, back then, they didn't care. <laughs> and they didn't care. <laughs> yeah, they didn't care. So. And there was something magical about that, to be honest with you. And so a lot of you listening may have never lived in that, in that time. But, but what, the reason I'm bringing that up is we've mistaken friendship for popularity, right? How many friends do you have on Facebook? Those are not friends. They misname them. A friend is someone you call and go to dinner with. A friend is someone you're in trouble and you give them a phone call and say, man, I need to talk this through with you. That's a friend, not a social media person who you occasionally see on Facebook or Instagram or, you know, Snapchat or Twitter or whatever, whatever the thing is of the X, day. X now. X, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, as good as those things can be, that does not take the place of relationships. Those are not relationships. And I think there's some misunderstanding. Those are relationships, right? I can get on a, a just blinked on name, swipe left, swipe right. Yeah, that. You can tell how much the, we use it. You can apps. tell how much we use it, right? Yeah, the dating yeah. apps. Uh, so, but you can get on there and have a relationship tonight. I'm sorry, that's not a relationship. That's called a hookup. And people mistake that for a relationship. And so I think the biggest thing, the biggest thing plugging our site is the definition of relationship. And, and, you know, look, I don't need, I saw this mafia guy and he says, his pre, prior mafia guy, and he says, I don't need a hundred friends. I need three motherfuckers who can take over a country. He goes, that's it. That's a friend. That's true. Hone those friendships. Who are those three guys in your life? You call them at three o'clock in the morning, they show up. They, you know, our, our big thing in our, in our ragtag group is, look, if I call you at three o'clock in the morning and I say, hey, I need you to come help me. We're going to hurt someone. We're never going to talk about it again. The other guy says, who's driving? Right. <laughs> you know? Oh, that movie uh, yeah, with yeah. Ben Affleck. The, 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 yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's your guy. Yeah. That's your friend. Yeah. Right? So I've tried that a few times with some of my friends, right? So I call up and do that very thing. Some of them haven't seen the show, right? So I'll call up and I'll say those very words and they're like, all right, when? Yep. <laughs> I'm like, that's my guy. When are we going? That's my guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, what, I mean, so this would constitute like 
what advice or because parents are, are, are a problem in this. Yeah. Um, and you know, we've had this conversation on, on, on the podcast before, but they, you know, they, you know, it's easier parenting if you just allow them to, you know, spend all their time on their phone or their devices or whatever it is. Um, you know, and, and I think COVID did not help this process. Made, uh, made it, it, it exasperated it for sure. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on, on that? Like you've raised five kids and yeah. you've got of the, f- I mean, the five kids, I mean, are they're, fun. These they're are all very, very people. successful in their own rights. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like they're phenomenal people. I'll say it for you. Like they really are phenomenal people. I agree. We've traveled with like virtually all of them, uh, around like in other countries and they're, I mean, they're three of them are doctors. So like, but I mean, that doesn't determine one's success, but it, but it tells it, you something about it them. It does tell you something about them. And the other, but the other know, two the other are two just are as successful in their own way. In, in business yeah, and, yeah. And, and, yeah. and their chosen career. Yeah. So it's like, it, it, it is, yeah, you have a beautiful family. So you, 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 you know, you've obviously done some things right with these kids. Like we were talking last night. It's like, man, you know, we didn't, I think you we didn't just get lucky. We just want to make sure they weren't pregnant and they weren't on drugs that by the it. time they got out our of high school. Our goal was <laughs> our job is to get you out of high school, not pregnant, not on drugs. After right. that, you're on your own. Yeah. And, you know, we said it half jokingly, but kind of half serious too. Um, and, and I will say what I said to you last night, all credit be to them once they became adults. Because, you know, I'm, I'm shining the flashlight, but they're on the business end of the shovel. It's their accomplishments are their accomplishments. I, mean, I don't, I want to even take credit for those. But thank goodness it was such a blessing that we've had five kids who have such determination. And we have a very highly successful family at this point. Our, our family is very successful and in, in everybody in it there. We don't really have that one person who doesn't. And we have before, but we don't. And so I would say, and there, the, that's also a chapter in my book because we have a blended family. Uh, we came together. Um, I brought three, she brought two. If you ask us which is which, we don't know because we purposely forgot and we don't remember and we treat them all just as terrible. And um, so, you know, <laughs> I forget too, actually, to be well, honest, they, honest with you. Sometimes honestly, I don't even think about honestly, it. Honestly, they forget. Yeah. And so, because we intentionally made rules that said, we don't say certain things, we don't say step in our family. There is no step in our family. It's a family, it's a mom and dad and five kids. And all five came from me and all five came from her, and we don't remember anything other than that. And honestly, neither do they. They don't say those words either. Um, and so that's a really good point to make. Yeah. I think it, language, know, language is powerful. Yeah. And most, most families are now You're my are brother or are you my stepbrother? Yeah. Well, those are not the same thing. No. Um, and so, um, so we, and so and, and in fact, two of our kids who didn't come from the same, who, who came here, uh, actually four of them are closer with each other and they are with their with the ones who have the same genes. I mean, honestly. And so, but that was intentional. That wasn't an accident. We didn't, we didn't just go down the river and hope that would happen. And it did. We did very specific things, you know, hanging in my kitchen right now on the wall is our family mission statement that they wrote when they were, I guess Spencer was probably 12 and Sydney was six. And they wrote, our, what was we said what are we as a family what does it mean to be in our family and we just asked them all these ideas and you know they were six to twelve so they wrote them in certain said them in certain ways and then we put them all on a, a paragraph and created a family mission statement mm-hmm. and then every, it hangs above your fireplace yeah and then every week when the kids were little and we'd have uh, game night or whatever we were doing we would stand and put our hands over our heart and say and repeat the family thing which I, I will say you guys as a family do some stuff. Like when you look at it, it's like, that's corny shit. Yeah. Traditions. Know, but a tradition, but they, they, but it works. It works. And, and I, so actually I'll, I just want to jump in and just go like, you know, for those families out there and there are many, um, you know, these are some tried and true principles that have worked for your family. We've in, implemented some of them. Um, and, and, um, and it, it the, I mean, it works. And, and so, guys... The goofier it is, it's almost like that makes you unique from the rest of the world. Everybody wants to belong to this elite group, right? The best thing about being special forces, other than getting to put your hands in your pockets when nobody else did, the best thing about it is we're different than everybody else. We're elite, right? 
as you, you walk around with that elite, not ego away. Well, it was ego back then, but there is, but there, you need that. You know, if you're going to go do so, we did, you have to have some of that. And so your family wants to feel like our family's different than our families. We're special. We're, and we do all feel that way. Like there's no place like our family. There's no place any of us would rather be as adults. Cause my oldest now is 35 and my youngest is 26. And we still are all of our most favorite thing together is be together. And, and that's not unintentional. It was very intentional. Well, take fast forward. I now have five adult children who have wives and, uh, uh, and husbands of their own and grandchildren who carry a laminated card of our family mission statement in their pocket in their wallets. Oh, wow. Do you, do you remember? Like, do you, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to put you on the spot. I do not to, have it memorized. To, you don't have it memorized. No. Yeah. I, I just, I know the pre, we'll, I can we'll, tell you the precepts. If you, but, I'd love yeah, for you to share yeah. it. And I'm happy mind. to share it with them. As it is a copy of it in my book and all I'm happy to just give you a copy to send out if you want to as well. Uh, so the concept was, and, and remember this did not come from the parents. I think that was what made this successful. We said to you kids, to you guys, what does it mean to be part of this family? And then we took those ideas and created it. So we had none of it in a, none of it, not one line of it is mine and Pam's. It's all theirs. Yeah. And so some of the things are kind of funny because it was a six-year-old saying it, right? And so it was, you know, our, our home is a sanctuary. We laugh and giggle and play without worrying about being judged. Those are their words. And so there's things like that throughout it that they wrote and they created. Yeah. No, it's, 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 a, cool, it's a cool concept. Every one, family, one of the things says, success, uh, failure is an intimate part of success. We have to fail so we can be successful. They wrote that. Yeah. Hmm. Now, what had happened is there's a book called... Um, the Traveler's Gift. It's an amazing book for families. And it comes in two versions. It comes in the, the one called The Traveler's Gift and one called The Traveler's Gift for Children. Or it might be called Traveler's Gift for Teens. It's the same story, but written at their level. And so what we would do when we were, when we are all living in the same, under the same house is when we would take family vacation, we tried to turn the vacation into a something more than just go have fun. We'd go have fun, but we'd all read a book together and then we'd talk about it. And so we had just got done reading that book. So a lot of the concepts from that book ended up in our family mission statement. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. So they had read the book and then they said, Hey, then we want it to be. And that's where that came from. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So that's they were, cool. so they were thinking along those lines. Right. Yeah. Which that gives it some great perspective yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, any other thoughts? Because I, I, I have actually a story to share. I'll, I'll share it now. So I remember I called you. Uh, we were struggling. Our son was a teenager. You know, boys will be boys. He's a really great kid. Um, he is. Uh, he really is. Um, but but um, other than his legs being th the keys being thrown in the lake, we'll tell that story <laughs> some other time. <laughs> um, that was the best. I was just telling that story. To, I just tell my staff that story the other night, that, like literally four days ago. Um, but uh, that's hilarious. He'll be listening to this going, "Oh shit!" But um, I remember calling you saying, "Listen, like you know." struggling with how do I discipline this kid? You know, I, what I was finding was, you know, taking the phone, taking the game, but which he didn't really do a lot of gaming anyways, but you're taking things away, which I just didn't like from a conceptual pr perspective, which is, it's like, well, you do something wrong. So I take something for you. It's not the lesson that you want. It's like, oh, well, your wife later on, all you do is you teach like, oh, your wife does something wrong. So you take your, your love away from them. Like it is the worst strategy on the planet. Yeah, um, but I, it is, I gotta stop doing that. But but it is the strategy <laughs> yeah, that, that uses. most people use. Because it's the only thing you know to do. Because that's what we learn. And so I called you and I said, listen, like, what did what did you do? And you said, Yep, um, I distinctly remember a time, I'll make this really short, but distinctly remember a time when both our son's names are Spencer, like your oldest son is Spencer. He said, I had Spencer, you know pushed up against the wall, like frustrated to hell, grab him by the shirt type of thing. By the throat, and, actually. By the throat. Yeah. Okay, I didn't yeah. want to, to say be clear. That, but, but, uh, and, he was and, 16. He wasn't six. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, right. 
but, but, you know, frustrated to the point of no end. And then you had explained how you started to implement, you know, um, athletic um, exercise to, 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 as a, as a, as a tool to yeah, help them remember the lesson. And, um, and so I was like, I'm going to do that. So next time Spencer, you know, screwed up, uh, so we took him out to the, you know, but you'd take him anywhere, to, but we took him out to the back of our farm. We had a big hill and there was myself and my wife, Tennille and my ex-wife, Terry, who were all super great friends, like best friends. And we're all sitting in the truck and it's February, it's cold, raining. And I'm like, okay, bud. Like, I think he showed up. He came in late. 20, 20 minutes late for his curfew. And I said, great, you're going to run this hill for 20 minutes straight. No stopping. Every time you stop, I add two minutes. Uh, no stopping. And, um, and, and um, you know, that's, this is going to be your discipline for coming in late, which it wasn't like the first time he came in yeah, late. Yeah, yeah, it was like sure. the 10th time sure, he came sure, in late, sure, whatever. Sure. But anyway, so boom, he runs the hills. The, he starts within two minutes. He twists his ankle. <laughs> It's a super rough terrain. He twists his ankle and immediately Terry, my, his mom, my ex-wife, uh, well, they're both moms, but uh, his, his birth mom, uh, Terry goes, oh my God, we got to stop. And I'm like, we're not stopping. <laughs> he, okay, he, broke it. He, kept, he kept going. I give him credit. He didn't stop. He kept going. Uh, did his 20 minutes uh, at about 15 minutes, like you know, he's struggling at 15 minutes. I go out and I'm cheering him on. And, and, um, and so he gets done. I said to the girls, I'm like, you, you drive, you drive back the truck, uh, to the farm, to the house. And I'll, I'll walk back with him. And it's fucking poor. It's, it is a shit day. And so I'm like, so I were walking back and I'm like that son, I said, son, look, I know you're mad at me and I don't expect you to, to answer or talk to me because because you're, you're pissed off, obviously, and, and maybe rightfully so. But I said, I said to him, we were walking back, and I said, I don't want, this is not a lesson about you to not make mistakes. I want you to make mistakes, because that's where you will learn. But what I want you to understand is there's a consequence to abusing um, the trust and... And, um, and understanding that if you're going to take a risk to do something, there is consequence and you got to manage that. And that's on you to manage the risk. And so I said, and I used the example, I said, if you mismanage your money, it will leave you. If you mismanage your relationship, it will leave you. If you mismanage your health, it will leave you. And so you have to understand that if you do A, there's always a second order consequence and there will be a cost to it. You just have to evaluate, is the cost the right cost? Is it worth it? And sometimes it will be and sometimes it won't be and you won't know, but you just have to understand. So you chose to come back late because you know, you're, price. you're hanging out with a girl and you're whatever, whatever it was that may have been probably worth it. wasn't, you were hanging out with his buddies and maybe it was worth <laughs> maybe it. Maybe it was worth it. <laughs> That final 10 minutes in the closet <laughs> could, have been, could have been awesome. Uh, but you, you've got to just now know. you got to pay the price. you you got to pay the price. And it's okay to make mistakes. This is not about making the mistake. This is about just understanding the risk and the consequences to the mistake. And if it was worth it, great. And um, two weeks later, he came home from school. And he said, he said, uh, had, a, had a thing at school. It's Okay. He's like, um, this kid was bugging another kid. Kind of, I kind of got involved. We got, you know, kind of pushy, whatever. I threw him down, <laughs> threw him down on the ground, and I, you know, grabbed him by the shirt, pulled back my, cocked my fist back, and he's like, I was about to hit him, punch him in the face, and he goes, and then, and he goes, and then I thought, how many minutes am I going to have to run, run that, run that <laughs> fucking hill? <laughs> <laughs> so he's, and so he didn't hit him. It's probably going to be 30 minutes. It's not worth I, it. Yeah, it was, was 10, I'd do it. Was 10, I'd do it. But 30, <laughs> right, no. Right. But, but, but that whole, that what whole concept lesson. was like, and so A, I don't know if I've ever, I don't know if I've ever told you that story, but, but I, but I thank you for it because it changed. It, fun, it was a fundamental change in our relationship and how we disciplined him 
um, and how he reacted to the discipline rather than this just constant, like, I'm going to take from you because you did something wrong, or I, I perceive you did something wrong because I'm the parent and I'm always right, which is complete bullshit anyways. Um, but, but anyways, I want to thank you. But mostly right. Yeah. But I wanted to thank you for that. (laughs) Um, and and just, that gave me, I literally got chills now. That's, that's a great story. Yeah. That's a great story. But I think it illustrates what you guys, you know, did with your kids, which was, you know, you They ran a lot that. of hills. A lot of hills. Yeah. I, it's right there behind us. That's, that's the hill right back there. <laughs> ask, ask any of them. Well, early, just ask Spencer Brock. They did most of the hill They running. did most of the hill running. The others were like, I'm not doing No, that. they watched and they're like, yeah, we're, we're not going to do that. Those two are idiots. <laughs> Those two are idiots. Yeah. Don't do, okay, don't do that. <laughs> that, just, that did happen. Yeah. So anyways, but that, I, yeah, just awesome. when it comes to I'm glad, kids I'm glad and you said that. relationships, I, I, I appreciate that lesson. I, I used to tell my kids all the time. I used to say, I call it the corral theory because we live on a farm, so the ranch, they can understand this. When you first start training a horse, it's a wild horse, and you guys have trained horses too. You start them off in what's called a round pit. And in the round pit, the only thing that horse can do is go in a very short circle, round and round. It doesn't matter how angry they get. They just can go round and round faster and faster, but they can't do anything else until they just get tired and they finally calm down. And then you can have a relationship with that horse. And the only way you can really form a relationship with a wild, crazy horse in the beginning is in a round pin. Because if they can get away from you, they're getting, going to get away. So you start in this round pin. And then once they get trained in the round pin, you put them in a little bit bigger corral and you work with them in the corral and then a bigger pin and a bigger pin. And pretty soon they have the whole ranch and they can walk around the ranch and you can go you know, get them. And, and every once in a while they start acting up and you don't, if they're acting up, you don't take them back to the last smaller corral. You take them back to the round pin. And so it's a weird, ana- no, excuse me, it's a weird analogy, but it works for us. I would say, The number one thing that you and I have to have, if I'm talking to my child, is I have to be able to trust you and you have to be able to trust me. You have to be able to say that what I would trust that what I say, I I mean, and that's what will or will not happen if I say it will or will not happen. And I also be able to trust when you say something to me. And so if you screw up, I am all about that. No problems. But if you lie to me about it, we're going to have a big problem. And I emphasize that their whole lives. I'm all about you failing. I'm all about you screwing up. I know that's going to happen. I Trust me, nobody's done it more than I have. But if I can't trust you about it, then we have a problem. And so when my kids would grow up, even in high school, they had way more privileges than their friends because the trust was there. As soon, and it didn't happen very often, but occasionally when that trust got broken, right back to the round pit. Well, now I can't trust you. So now I can't trust anything you say. And so now you're going to have to earn my trust back. And if I ever lie to you, you do the same to me, by the way. I would tell them that. And so that changes your relationship with them. For us, at least, it did change our relationship. It wasn't about what's right or wrong. It was about, can I trust you and can you trust me? And so then when I'd have conversations about right and wrong, I would say, listen, I know at 16 you know everything. That must be awesome. But you're going to forget that you knew everything in about 10 years. (laughs) right? But for now, it's cool because there's a short time in your life where you know everything, and that's great. I said, but have we always trusted each other? Yes, Dad. Well, then you're going to have to trust me when I tell you this and whatever the thing was that I would tell him. i say, you don't have to understand why. Just trust me that what I'm telling you is true because I've never lied to you. And that changed that conversation because we talked about it so often, right? And so, look, I'm sounding like it was all perfect. It wasn't all perfect. You raised five teenagers. They were all teenagers at the exact same time, by the way. They had a 13 year old and a 19 year old at the same time and everything in between. So no, it was, it was a chaos is what it was. It was, I would have said controlled chaos, but it was just chaos <laughs> when there's five and then I'm only two of you. But I honestly, people say, man, I hate raising teenagers. And I was like, I'd go back and do it all over again. Yeah. I loved it. I can't say I, that. I loved it. 
I yeah. loved it. I mean, I had such a great time with them. The only and people that say that though, are the people that are in it in the middle. Like, yeah. yeah the, when you're in it. Yeah. There's been days where I would have said that for trust me, but man, going back, I'd do it again tomorrow. I with all five of them all over. I had five of them in college at the same time. I had five of them as teenagers at the same time. Um, biggest payday I ever got was the last one got out of college. <laughs> you, you have five. I mean, you know, the price of college times that by five. That'll, yeah. that'll take a bite out of your paycheck. Yeah. And, uh, and they're in school for a long time. And they're in school for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. They're in school for a long, long time. Right. Time. So, um, yeah. So the round pin theory works for us. Uh, that's in my book as well. I describe it in, in there. And it wasn't about taking away privileges. It was about taking away the ability or rekindling the ability to trust you. For example, none of my kids had cell phones. They all carried one of my cell phones. I said, you didn't buy a cell phone. I bought a cell phone. That's my cell phone. And I'm happy to let you use it as long as I can trust you. As soon as I can't trust you, I'm going to have to take my cell phone back. Because you don't have a cell phone. You don't have a car. But I'm willing to let you use mine that I bought for you to use as long as I can trust you using it. As soon as I can't trust you using it, I'm going to take my car back. That was kind of our, just our thing the whole time. I said, kids, we're not rich. I'm rich. You're poor. You have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a damn dime. Right. So we're not rich. I'm rich. You're poor. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's well, it's a good point. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, no, I mean, not to ki kick this to death, but you know, now they're all rich by the way with, <laughs> on with, their own accord with the, with the, with the kids part. Um, how essential do you think it is, you know, from the point of the parent and the discipline that the parent needs to exercise? At, towards is it yeah. consistency so, so, or what would be the word i think it's consistency if i say it it's going to happen if i say if you're not home by 10 o'clock there's going to be a consequence and then i don't do it i've lost all credibility just like if i tell them if you do this i'll reward that in some way and i don't do it i've also lost credibility so it goes both directions right. But again, it goes back to when I say something, you better believe it's true because I promise you that's what's going to happen. And to this day, that's true in my family. If you tell, if they say, if you ask any of my kids, they'll say, oh, if dad says it, trust me, it's going to happen. Well, that's what I wanted. So that when they tell me something, I can also trust that. Now, did they ever do shit they didn't tell me about? I didn't know about it till about 10 years later, but of course they did because they're kids, right? They're teenagers. Right. And they should do and, that. And they, and they should do that. That's yeah. not what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm talking about lying, right? So, you know, you find out after they become adults, all kinds of shit they did. You didn't know about <laughs> just like we did with, with, with our parents, but none of it was bad stuff, right? It was all just fun, teenage, crazy ass stuff that they were doing. And so I'm not, that, that I was not opposed to. Um, but I think consistency is important. I think, Look, in a traditional family, right? Because there's a lot of non-traditional families. And by traditional, I don't mean not blended. By traditional, I mean where there's a mom and a dad available, right? Because obviously there's a lot of single moms out there trying to, and God bless them. That's a terrible, hard thing to do because it's hard enough to raise a child with a parent, with a dad and a mom. I can't imagine trying to raise a child by yourself where you're the dad and the mom. Uh, that would be very difficult. So... But in a traditional family where you have a dad and a mom, I think the kids need to be just slightly scared of death. Just a little bit, right? Not that you ever did anything, but they know you could. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think to this day, they're just slightly afraid of me. <laughs> yeah. just, I, definitely yeah. on my end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just a little bit. Yeah. And, and that's okay. You know, yeah. I know there's a day when they kick my ass, but not today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think there's a little bit, you, you never need to exercise it as long as they know. I think there's, I don't, I don't even know how to say that in a way that's probably politically correct nowadays, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. I was a little scared of my dad mm -hmm. and that works very well. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, I think that there's you. I mean, I think you're 100 percent right. And and if it's not politically correct, it should be politically yeah. correct. Yeah. Like that, that's the problem. Yeah. That is sometimes Strong the core boys. problem. They need to know yeah. shit. Oh, Spencer got in a fight one time at school, and the school he was at had this still spanked kids. And he had to sign a thing at the first of the year as a parent that says, can my son get or daughter get a spanking if they do something wrong? I'm sure that's not even a thing anymore, but but it was back then. Okay? Yeah, definitely not now. Yeah, they could get a couple swats for whatever they did wrong. The prince, Only the principal could do it. Right? So and it didn't happen very often, but it was the thing. <laughs> I remember Spencer got in a fight. He gets called in the principal's office, and the principal's like, well, what are we going to do, Spencer? And he goes, just get out the get out the switch or whatever they call this paddle or whatever it was, and the principal was like, "Well, I'm going to call your dad." So it's like, do anything but that. <laughs> Beat me, burn me, don't call my dad. <laughs> that's you're going to what? And that's what it should be like, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, actually, for in our family, it was my mother was like that. She was she was the disciplinarian for sure. Um, I'd love to move on to 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 get through these 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 six pillars. Um, I would love to talk about intimate relationships, but my hope actually is is that we can get Pam and Tennille sure. into a conversation at some point in time down the road and we do a completely different podcast right. on intimate relationships because I think you guys have carved out you know really done amazing things with the teachings that you do in intimate relationships. Um, and Tennille and I have had a tremendous amount of And we started that journey with you guys. We did, yeah. We all started that journey together, together. which was great. Yeah. Yeah. And I was uh, um, the, 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 the worst of the bunch in regards to, like, I was the, I believe, I was the least uh, equipped um, emotionally, mentally, um, to be successful in an intimate relationship. It was probably my weakest area in life for sure. Well, not probably for sure. It was the weakest area in my life. Um, and because it was my weakest, I've had to really work hard. Um, and my ex-wife and my, my daughter's mother, they'll all tell you that <laughs> it was the weakest area in my life. Um, so I would love to have that yeah. conversation. And, but, and so- but kudos to you because now it's the strongest yeah. and no, for real. Like kudos to you because it didn't have anything to do with your relationships. It had to do with self work inside of you, and you were willing to do that and take on that hard task because that's the heaviest. I mean, the hardest work we do is right between here and here. Yeah, by, I, by I, far. I, and and now I listen to your words, and they're not even the same words anymore. It's it's uh, so kudos to you. Well, I think my point to it was not for that. Was really to well, too bad you get it anyway. Exercise. The, <laughs> it's really to exercise the point about getting the girls on, because two guys talking about intimate relationships is probably it's you're only fifty percent of the conversation. So and probably needs to be done more often. Yes, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Honestly. So because so guys I, don't talk about that. It, it's, it's funny because when we did the couples course, we intentionally, so it's a three-day course, and I intentionally every day take the guys apart for a couple hours, and Pam takes the girls apart for a couple hours because we can't sit and talk about our feelings all fucking day, right? But they can. And so knowing the difference between those two things, so I'll take the dudes and we'll go shoot guns, we'll go ride horses, we'll do something different that has nothing to do with that. And we joke about all the stuff we've been talking about, right? How stupid it all is, because that's what guys do. But it doesn't mean it's not as important. We just have a different way of approaching that together, because we don't want to go up and just cry to each other all the time, right? So we have to do it in a masculine kind of way, but it's just as important to us. And so I think it's okay if your dude to have intimate relationships and those kind of things, and also still be a manly man. They are not incompatible. In fact, I would say that's what makes you more able to be more masculine. Well, the women need it, right? They, women, they want the masculine feminine energy. energy needs the masculine yeah. energy. Yeah. So she, does, she doesn't want you to become her, right? We we we'll get into that. I think we, I think we're close to getting the girls. My my wife is, you know, did you say get, ver, very opposed to being did, on the podcast? But yeah, you know, gonna, mine is as well. I know. Yeah, but what if gonna, we start? We'll it, but if we start them out making out. Yeah. And then we lead it from there. <laughs> That's why we can't do this together right there. <laughs> oh, shit. You know, All right. Sharpen the sword. Yeah. Mental and spiritual. Yeah. Yeah. 
So that has a lot of meaning to different people. And so I kind of use the word sharpening the sword. So it kind of encompasses everybody. Whatever your thing is, you should really, really believe in that thing. And you should spend time thinking about here. Here's where I've, I've had a very, very interesting spiritual journey over my life. I went from a very organized religion, uh, day in, day out to a very, no, absolutely no religion at all. I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with that ever again to back to what is my relationship in the universe, in the cosmos with God. And what does that need to, for me, what does that need to look like? And I think that's a journey everybody should take. It doesn't matter as much what your summary is or what your conclusion of that is. In fact, it will change over time. Mine certainly has. But the journey is worth taking for the journey's sake. You know, for the journey's sake of, have you taken the time? You know, somebody said, I think I heard on a podcast or somebody said, somebody said, what are you going to do about the Jesus question? He said, what do you mean? He said, Jesus Christ. What are you going to do about that? Because you can't just leave it alone. You can't pretend it isn't there. So you're going to have to at least think about it. Is that right? Is it wrong? Is it different than I've been told? Is it another thing? Is it nothing? But you can't, not, you can't ignore it. It's there. What are you going to do about the God question? Are you just going to pretend it doesn't exist? Or are you going to take some time on your thinking time and think about for you, what does that mean and how does that affect the rest of what you do? Uh, what does your spirituality mean to you? And what does that mean to Nick? Now, everybody's going to be, the good thing about religion is everybody knows the answer. They just can't agree with each other. <laughs> 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 but they're all 100% sure they're right. 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 They're, I think it was even Napoleon Hill way back in the day, he wrote his, his, in his book, uh, uh, Key to Riches. He said, the good news is, when you're 100% right, if you start disagreeing, it's okay. You can go two blocks down and still be 100% right. <laughs> right? So I don't think the right answer is the goal. I think the journey is the goal. What's the journey? What's the process? And, and, and I'm not so interested anymore in what is the right answer. I'm more interested in what is the right question. What's the question I should be asking about that? Is there questions that you do ask, like specific ones? Or, sure, or that you sure. Found, or Over time, they've certainly changed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, here's, here's a question for you. What is your relationship with God? What is it? Is it, I don't have one because there isn't one? Is it, we know of each other, but we don't talk? Is it, we talk every day? Is it... I don't know the answer to the question, but it's a very interesting question, right? Yeah, everybody's answer is going to be different. And it doesn't matter the answer. Yeah. The, the, the journey is the question. And your answer may be different 10 years ago and 10 years now and 10 years from now because the journey is the process of answering that question, right? And so I, I'm not trying to get anybody to lean one way or another. I'm saying just take the time so that you're comfortable with your place in the cosmos. If you think that, you know, whatever you think and you, but you've taken the time to think through it and be willing to have, ask yourself the hard questions like that. Like what is my, what is spirituality to me? What does that mean? Does that mean loving other people? Does that mean praying every day does that mean meditation does that mean spending time in the wilderness does that mean what is spirituality and what am i doing to incorporate whatever i believe that is into my life yeah they're i mean they're powerful questions and and, and i i mean i'm fairly aligned with that in terms of like to me it's an exploration of where i fit into the universe and you're right it has changed so many times mine too uh, but I'm, I'm curious like on the so there's the spiritual side and then there's the mental side to the sharp and the saw. Yeah. And how, how do they, do they integrate? I, I just, I think there's a lot of crossover, right? So, so the mental side, let's, I'll get to the integration here in a second. So the mental side, I 
talking more about reading, listening to audiobooks, taking courses, going to conferences, growing mentally in the areas of business and finance and uh, spirituality and, you know, all these books right here. You know, what else can I learn? Autobiographies, biographies. I've been never really been interested in the Civil War until these last couple of years. And I've been fascinated the last couple of years, everything about it. So I took a trip back east this last um, two months ago and went and visited all the Civil War sites. And just the stories are just incredible. It's not nearly as straightforward as everybody would want us to believe it is, right? It was so complicated and so many emotions and literally fighting, killing your brothers. And it was just so difficult, right? There were so many tragedies and so many horrible things. And then uh, the next day I might be reading a book about, you know, how to uh, uh, refurbish my 68 Chevelle. So that's the mental side is how can I just continue to grow? So one of my favorite, uh, there's an app called Wondrium. It used to be called The Greatest Courses. And it basically is prof the best professors from all over the world and best is rated by their students. Who's the highest rated professors, the best teachers, right? And then they take and record their courses that they teach in college and record them as a course. And so you'll have lectures one through 18 of their courses. And some are on video and some are audio, mostly video, but you can just listen to them also. And they teach their course on whatever it is, right? So I'm doing American history one right now. I just did one on Old Testament. So I'll do things I'm interested in, and then I'll literally randomly pick one and just something I would have never done. Just to see, right? And this, this is an app? Called, yeah, it's called, an app called Wondrium. Wondrium. Yeah, it's a <laughs> wonderful app. And best courses in the world. And so on any subject, anything you can possibly think of, there's a course on it. And so um, I took one. I was doing my whole finger thing, and I took one. It's called uh, um, History of Baroque Music in the like uh, 15th century. I was like... Well, there's something I never would have cared about, yeah. but, but my, but my thing is that I'll do it. So I listened to this thing. I decided to chunk it. So, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Right. So I did it while I was working out for about four weeks. Cause it was, I think it's like 12 lectures or something. It was fascinating. Yes. Because the professor was so excited about what he was teaching. And he, you know, when somebody's excited about something, you kind of want to hear about it. And he was such a good teacher. By the end, I was like, that was one of the best courses I've ever taken. Never would have thought that was a thing. So you never know. So that's kind of the mental to me is how can I just continue to expand my mind and think about more and more things? And of course, that crosses over into spirituality. If you start reading books about spirituality or you start reading or listening or taking courses, I'm fascinated by theology. Um, I, I really love the concept of learning about cultures and religions of the ancient past and how they became what they were and what they did with each other and how the three monotheistic religions came to who they, what they are today. And what's the history of that? That's fascinating to me. So I, and like when you look around, like, I mean, we're in your office now and there's hundreds of books here um, it, it, uh, uh, along the wall in the bookshelf. There's a, a ton of biographies. Yeah, uh, I love biographies. Like, like it's insane how many biographies yeah. are sitting here. Well, you know, is there specific, what is the, I mean, ultimately we're really talking, we're talking about learning growth. Uh, you're an, you know, vivacious reader and, and learner. What is the, like you said, like the, whether it's 15th century broke music or, you know, a biography on, you know, uh, Theodore Roosevelt there. And what, what, what is the, I don't want to say what's the outcome, but what has the, been the greatest lessons from being an avid learner? So I would say the greatest thing for me about being an avid learner is I am who I am because I'm a sponge for knowledge. I cannot stop learning. Like I would rather listen to an odd. So I, I actually like listening to books more than I like reading them. Believe it or not. Um, I do both but I really enjoy the listening, especially if you have a good speak, a good author or a good uh, reader, I guess. I would rather do that than listen to music. 
I, I just have this fascination by learning new concepts, new ideas, new things, and just taking little pieces or learning nothing maybe, just but listening to them and you, you always absorb something. But when I've listened to biographies and I've read hundreds of biographies or listened to, here's what I've learned. All of these great men and women were just regular women, men and women. Regu regular men and who, women. Who yes. just kept going. Right. They had all the same problems. And so some of them had so many more problems and difficulties and illnesses and broke and bankruptcy and all these things. The difference between them and us and the reason they got in a biography is because they just didn't let it stop them. That's it. That's the lesson. That's all it is. Every single one of those books is true what I just said. From Steven Tyler, from Aerosmith, to Teddy Roosevelt, to Winston Churchill, to Noah, to whoever it is, they just kept going. Where most people, when they run into the roadblock they went ran into, would have stopped. And they just don't. They just, for whatever reason, that's, I think, the grit that you learn from them is the, probably the most important thing. Yeah. Well, you learn, I think, you learn that other people have problems too. Yeah. And, and they had big ones. Yeah. Not like little ones, like huge ones. Some of the problems they ran into, you're just like, I don't I mean, Teddy Roosevelt's known for being kind of a manly stud. He's a weak, puny little boy who barely lived through through age 12 because he had such bad asthma. They could, he couldn't even walk. And he decided when he was a little kid, the only way he was going to have a life at all is if he started exercising and became a freak about exercise and overcame his own physical problems. And nobody knows that part of the story. Yeah, it's just stuff like that. It's just crazy. Yeah, I find in general, like, the here's the risk. The risk of um, continuing to learn about what you already know narrows your ability to focus on the bigger picture. Yes. And that is the one theme that I've seen with guys like you or people like you, women, men and women like you, who, who are vivacious learners that they, you know, they have this cross section or of, of, of intelligence and awareness, awareness maybe is the better word if I'm searching for one versus, you know, the people who are just like, okay, I just focus on whether it's real estate or whether it's sales or whether it's boats or whatever the topic is. It's like, you know, they become very tunnel. I agree. I think you have to decide at some point in your life, because I've had this conversation with myself, I'm intelligent enough that I could have become the world's expert at something. But in order to become the world's expert at something, you're going to have to ignore everything else. And that's a decision you're just going to have to make. Would you like to become the world's expert at a thing? And that's the only thing you ever do. Or would you like to be, have a whole broad range of things you do? And I chose to go broad. I want to fly airplanes and I want to scuba dive and I've been to 65 countries on seven continents and I've, you know, I wanted that life because my thing became creating a spectacular life. And to me, that wasn't sitting in a lab because I love lab work back in the day, sitting in a lab, discovering a new thing or creating a new, you know, a new thing. I, I think I had, I think I could have done that, um, but I didn't want that life. I even, even medicine, I, I, I'm, I'm an expert in medicine but I'm not the world's expert in medicine, but I could have been had I ignored everything else and only thought, and only thought about medicine. Which then has those second order consequences yeah. that, Both you know, ways. whether it's family, Both relationships. Ways. Uh, family, yeah. relationship, all that stuff's great in my life, but I'm not the world's expert. But the world's expert doesn't have the life I have. I have a buddy who's a thoracic surgeon. We um, went to medical school together. He actually operated on my dad. And he's, he's, world-renowned thoracic surgeon and we were talking when he was operating on my dad i said man i'm so proud of you i said well you must have got a lot smarter after medical school you know joking with him and he said yeah i think i did all right and he said he said he said and he, he we we're sitting there talking i love this guy he's really smart and he says but you did it the right way and i said what do you mean and he goes in 25 years i don't see my family i've been in the hospital for 25 years I haven't, I haven't done anything except this. He said, if I had to do it again, I'd do what you did. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting lesson.
Well, listen, you are an example of, a, of, of an abundant learner, that's for sure. Um, and speaking of abundance, that's the next pillar. Uh, Ooh, so, nice transition. Yeah, I you like, like how I did that? That's really cool. Uh, kind of pro-like. <laughs> <laughs> I actually said abundant, and then I looked down and went, oh, fuck. It's very Rogan-esque uh, of you. <laughs> so gratitude, contribution, and giving. And this is, I mean, I think a key area of your life, but it's, it, it, and it should be a key area of others for sure. Um, do you want to share a little bit about, you know, I was given a course recently, a Valkyrie course. That's the women's course that come here. And, and one of the girls said, you know, money's not the most important thing. And I looked at her and I said, you have money. And I know her husband and her rabbit fly around in jet. In order to say money is not the most important thing, you already have some. That's always true. The, when I couldn't pay my light bill, if you'd have told me that, I told you, fuck off. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Right. But it is true once you get to a certain place that that's no longer the most important thing. And I think that's also true with contribution. It's very, very hard to have the same level of contribution if you can't figure out how to feed your kids. You know, the best way... In, to help the poor is not to become one of them. And so I think it is important to start the conversation by saying, in order to give, you have to be at a certain place to give. And I think that's been true for both of our lives. And so, it, yeah, when I was 25, could I have given? Yeah, and I think I did, but not in the same way that I can not now. I didn't have the knowledge then. I didn't have the experience then. I didn't have the means then. And so... I think that's also a journey. Contribution is a journey because as you get more to contribute, you can and should start to want to have that need to contribute more and more. And uh, so if you're out there and you're just starting your business last week and you're struggling and you can't even make ends meet, understand that we understand that. I understand that. That's There's a time to have this conversation. Contribution is always important. Gratitude is always important. But hopefully at some point you have more time to reflect about that than you probably do right now. Yeah. And and it's and contribution is not just about con contributing money. No, no, no. I mean contribution of all kinds. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Really time, time knowledge, knowledge, expertise, wisdom. And you gain all of those as you go along in life. Right? My... When I, my 17 year old self didn't have much to contribute <laughs> in, any, in any of those categories, right? So hopefully as you go along, you get more things to contribute, not just, not just money. Yeah, no, that's, that's a hundred percent. Do you have any, any thoughts? Like, do you have like a, anything that you want to talk about in terms of gratitude in regards to the development, your journey, when it comes to being able to find gratitude? I've always been very blessed in that I've always realized I'm very blessed. I've always recognized that I'm a member of the Lucky Sperm Club, right? I was born at this time in this country, and I had nothing to do with that, you know? And that's a member of the Lucky Sperm Club. I did nothing for that. And I was born in a land of opportunity in a time, in the greatest time in the history of the world, Right. The richest man in history, Solomon, would have given everything he had to ride in one car. Can you imagine if you drove up, picked him up in a car? He'd have been like, what? Yeah. And we all say he was the richest man in the world. He didn't have a microwave. Oven? Can you imagine? They'd have been freaking out. An ice maker? You know, the things we take for granted, I think if you just take some time to recognize, people are like, oh, we live in a troubled world. You don't live in a troubled world. <laughs> For goodness sake, this is the best thing that's ever happened to people. People envied this day. This is the time. This is the day. I was talking to somebody the other day, and she's like, you know, I, I don't know. It's the worst time ever. I'm like, what are you talking about? And she said, these poor people in such and such. And I said, but that's not you. That's not the life you're living. The problem with modern social media and modern news is it, you, if you want to concentrate on it, it can feel like you're living that. You're not living that. You're living right here. Everything's great. And, you know, our conveniences, our opportunities are better than they've ever been for most people in the Western world. Now, if you're a woman in North Korea, that's a different discussion, obviously. 
you're a person living in Iran, if you're a person, so I'm not talking about the entire world. I'm talking about my life and my gratitude and my blessings. Um, and so just recognizing that every day, if you've never done it before, there's a thing on YouTube called the 21 day abundance meditation done by Deepak Chopra. Oh man, that thing is so good. It's so good. It's so you introduced me to it. It's so good. I've introduced not no less than 20 groups to that. I've done the thing you did with me probably 20 different times now. I just finished. I just finished 21 days a couple days ago. And if, if if you're out there and you haven't done it, just look up a 21 day abundance meditation with Deepak Chopra. And it's really about this. It's about realizing the world is very abundant and all the things we have to be grateful for. I think just spending some time every day, just like you do, spend some time every day in gratitude is extremely important because you, 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 even in your worst of days, even when I was sick, I was grateful that I had a dialysis machine in my house. I was grateful that I had someone taking care of me. I was grateful that my hands worked. I was grateful. There's always plenty to be grateful for. And that changes who you are, I think, if you just do that over and over again. Yeah, and I, I feel that there's, because um, there was time in my life where I didn't feel grateful. Um, and and I think that there's, um, it's, it is like a muscle that you can develop. You know, you, you have to start the practice of gratitude. And sometimes, sometimes I was faking it, you know, it's okay. or, 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 or maybe I shouldn't say faking it. The options I had to perceive gratitude were, um, not as plentiful. So I'd be like, okay, I'm grateful for my daughter, for my son, for my wife. Um, you know, and then, you know, you know, some employees piss you off. So, oh, fuck, they're not on the list. <laughs> <laughs> cross them <laughs> so, out. Yeah, cross them out. But then, but now it's like, you know, I was, uh, the other day I was stopped at a stoplight and I was looking at the trees. It was just like a normal, st- it wasn't like beautiful. Like it was a, it was like downtown, but I was just looking at the trees and I'm like, oh my, like I just saw the beauty in it and could perceive f- 10 years ago, no way I would have been able to see the, yeah. gr- the gratitude in that. Being present. But, but I was just, yeah, me more present. So I think, you know, for people out there that who are like, who, cause literally, I literally three days ago had a meeting with someone and I was actually very shocked at what they had to say um, about, you know, they made comments like, well, we're electing, you know, radical, crazy leaders in this world. And, and I'm like, well, like, like who? And they're like, well, Putin. And I'm like, um, actually, uh, he wasn't elected. Don't think we elected that guy. We, you know, nobody elected him. He elected himself. Like, Certainly, you didn't elect him, right? Well, but but, but neither did, did anybody people, else, right? Like you know what I mean? Like he he put himself in. He's a, he's a dictator. Not to say we haven't elected crazy people. We elected Adolf Hitler. That has been done in the past, and we're still here to survive it. And we're arguably the world is better off today. You know, people in many countries. I was just in Morocco, Northern Africa. Um, and you know, that they are better off. Well, the standard of living worldwide is higher than it's ever been. The the level of poverty is the lowest of all time. Yep. More access to education, you know, and that's just increasing, you know, you know, internet accessibility, which is, which is information. Information is knowledge. Knowledge is applied. Knowledge is power. You know, all those kinds of things, like we are moving constantly to a better place and there is a lot to be grateful for. But if you want to look at what is wrong, which, which is the problem with media today, uh, and social media, then there is plenty. And, and you've got to be very careful. So that's the thing. Both things are out there, right? I mean, today, a little girl got raped. And today, a man went and took a child out of a shelter and became his big brother. Both of those are true. It's not one is optimistic, one's pessimistic. They're both 100% true. It's just which one do you want to focus on? That's all it is because they both happen today. Yeah. And so and within the last 30 seconds, and probably. that's true every day. And so you can focus all your energy on one or you can focus energy on the other one. You don't have to be blind to the fact that there's problems, but you also don't have to over focus on the fact there's problems. And I think too, I would just, I'd maybe add to the conversation. If you're finding that these are the conversations that you're engaged in seeing the, the downside or that glass half empty or what's not available versus what is available, 
you probably need to look at some of the people you're hanging out with and having conversations with and, and changing the proximity of, of your, your close relationships. And, and if you're being honest with yourself, if you're spending the time we talked about earlier, is it serving you? Is it making you better? Is it making you a better person to be thinking like that? Is that, is that stimulating you? Is that making you want to grow? Is that making you want to do more? Uh, by the way, the time before 10 a.m. is not used scrolling because that will be the temptation when you say, well, you know what, I'm finally going to have some time to myself and you're going to stop and start scrolling. And that's exactly the opposite of what you need to be doing. Trust me, I know it's a temptation. I've been there, done that. And an hour later, I'm like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not saying I'm, not, I'm perfect. I'm just saying that's not what the time's supposed to be for. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, last one, man, leadership and mission. What am I, I love the question, what am I here to do? You asked that earlier. Like, that's a fucking phenomenal question. What am I here to do? But I, do you find like people tend to veer away from those questions because they're so large. I have to answer it. Yeah. I don't want to answer it. Yeah. What's my relationship with God? I don't want to answer that. It's too big of a question. So how do you do it? Because you do ask yourself big questions. Yeah. Like that's one yeah. powerful thing yeah. that you do yeah. and have done for years, yeah. all the years I've known you, yeah. is you ask yourself big, bold, powerful questions. Um, but A, how'd you get into that? Because you weren't probably always like no. that. And, and then... What a, obviously there's tons of benefits and that would be a bad question, but it's like, how did you, how did you adapt yourself to asking those big, bold, tough questions? Yeah. I don't know if I've thought about that before, but I would say that I, I don't think I jumped into it like a jumped in the deep end of a pool. I think I waded into it and started asking, you know, little bit bigger questions, a little bit bigger questions. And I became more obsessed with the question, <laughs> the questions of the questions, which is, like I said earlier, if I'm not interested in the right answer, but I'm interested in the wrong question or the right question, how can I ask a better question? How can I ask myself a better question about that? And just start thinking about, am I asking myself good enough questions? Because look, if I say, how's my relationship with my wife? It's good. It's good. Really. How often do you guys make love? Oh, I don't want to answer that. Not right now. We're kind of not getting along. You know? Do you guys cuddle when you go to bed at night? Or do you both roll over and look at your phones? You, there's a better question than how's my relationship with my wife. Right? So if I were going to ask you, how's your relationship with Tanil? The worst thing I could probably ask you as a dude to dude is, how's your relationship with Tanil? Well, be the greatest. No, mine, my, you know what mine is. Uh -huh. But in general, as guys, we would say, it's great. And if you were saying, and if, it was, and if it was great, you'd say that. And if it wasn't great, you'd still say that. That's the problem, right? We can't get to the truth because we're going to say great no matter what the answer is. Right? And so you say great. I don't know what that means. It doesn't have, that doesn't have any meaning. Now, if you said, it's the best it's ever been. It's fantastic. It's amazing. Well, that would be a very unusual answer, right? I'd be like, whoa, nobody's ever said that, which would be true. Nobody's actually ever said that before, right? Yeah, I know it's true, but we're not willing to ask the harder questions, right? If you said to me, how's your relationship with Pam? It depends on our relationship, mine and your relationship. I would say, oh, it's great. You say, what do you guys do to make it great? Whoa, that's a good question. That's a good question. Right? That's a really good question. Like, no, specifically, do you guys have weekly habits you do that make it better? That's a really, really good question. And so I think you can always ask yourself, what's a better way to ask that than would ask? I always call it shallow and deep. You know, I went into one of my uh, business people, marketing people the other day, and I had a conversation with her for three hours. And I said, you know, I'm not going to leave this up here, right? I said, I I've got to, it's not my nature. I've got to ask the hard question because I don't think anything happens until we make the uncomfortable comfortable. I, with myself, I have to be, what is the uncomfortable thing? I really don't want to ask myself. Well, that's the thing I need to ask myself. That's the thing I need to ask myself. Am I really okay with this behavior I keep doing? 
I know the answer is no, but I don't want to ask myself that question because I don't want to say the answer is no because I want to keep doing it, right? Am I really okay with how much I drink? I don't want to ask myself that because I might not be. And I want to be honest with myself about it. By the way, that was a hypothetical question I have. To <laughs> <laughs> the, um, it, you know, it, it, it is, it is um, the exercise of going deeper. Yeah. It, it, you know, it is a, the discipline of like doing it with, it ha if you don't do it with yourself, you will not do it with other people. That's my, that's my experience. hundred percent. You don't know how. Yeah. You don't know how, if you haven't gone deep with yourself, you don't know how to go deep with other people. Because if you think about it, Dwayne, in order to go deep with yourself, what do you have to do? You have to answer the, you have to ask the hard questions, which means you have to think of hard questions to ask. It's the only way to go deeper to, is, is to just ask yourself harder and harder questions and be able to be honest in your answers about those. And the last day of our courses, <coughs> we have a personal one-on-one -on -one interview. And I look for the hardest thing to ask right off the bat. Because I just want to, I don't want to say, well, how was it? How was the course? And I don't want to do that. I want to go something I observed about them during the time and go right to the heart of the problem and get comfortable being uncomfortable. And one of the best ways to do that, by the way, is to say to yourself, if you're working with yourself, or to say to somebody else, listen, this is going to be super uncomfortable for us to talk about, so let's just acknowledge it's going to be un uncomfortable. And now we can talk about it. Right? Let's just acknowledge neither one of us wants to talk about this, but we need to talk about it. And so many people don't do that. Yeah. I mean, they, they have this tendency to want to like go up to the line or close to the line, but the crossing the line creates that level of conflict. And the problem is it's not conflict is not the concern. It's the absence of repair. That is the concern. I think I, I do hundred percent agree with that. And I also think people's need to be right. is so strong. You know, if I say to you, what's your relationship with God? We keep coming back to this question because it freaks people out because I just crossed a line that cannot be crossed, right? Friends cannot ask each other that question. What kind of friends are those? Yeah. Avoid, right. pol what do they say? Avoid politics, avoid politics, religion. Politics, religion, right? Because, yeah. Yeah. But, so, but if I say to you, you know what? What's your relationship with God? The reason you don't want to answer the question is because you might give the wrong answer, as if there's a wrong answer. But you're afraid you might offend me in your answer or I might be judging you in your answer. So our need to be right is so strong that we don't ask ourselves the right question, even to ourselves, right? How do I, how do I really feel about my dad? Well, I might give you exactly what I should say, even if I'm only talking to me. Well, I have to say a certain way. Yeah, but how do you really feel? Even if you're just asking yourself that question, it has certain politically correct answers. And so whatever that thing is for you, I'm just making some up, but whatever that thing is for you, that's the question nobody really wants to dig into. That's probably the thing holding you back. So, you know, when you said that, like, because ultimately the original question, what am I here yeah. to do relates to leadership and mission. Yeah. And so I just, it was interesting when you kind of said that need to be right or the fear of being judged. How do you think that affects like that whole leadership slash mission and how we create that, develop it? Um, yeah, so intimately, right? Because I think my need to be right for a long time certainly held back my mission. My need to prove something to myself or to somebody else or my need to be correct. I didn't even know it, obviously. I wasn't a conscious thing. But looking back, I was like, ah, oh, because I was wanting to be right. You know, we'd sit with Keith. He'd always say, quit trying to defend it. Quit trying to be right. Just listen. It's okay if the person talking to you is wrong. 
but at least listen. And then when they're done, you can say they just don't understand the situation. That's fine. But arguing with them isn't, doesn't help. And so the more ability do you have to be able to say, well, that's interesting. That, that, that's interesting. That, that, that could be true. So my mission, what is my mission here on earth? What is my mission here in the cosmos? What am I here for? Can't be tied to what would make my ego happier. Those are have to be separate. And that's hard to do. That's why you need some personal time. It's hard to separate those two things. Because one question is, what would make me look better in the eyes of others? And one is, what am I actually here to do? And those are two different questions, but they feel like the same question in the beginning. In the beginning, that sounds like the same thing, but it's not the same thing once you start to pull that apart. That kind of goes back to how we started the whole podcast. What did I learn when I was sick? That that really wasn't me, even though I thought it was. The me who was really me was a separate thing from all of that. And now what is my purpose here? What is my mission here right now? And I will tell you, unlike the light that comes from heaven and tells you, I don't think it's something you have to answer. It's a journey. It's not something that comes to you one day and you go, ah, now I know my purpose. Because I think, having done it for 60, having lived for 61 years, that that has changed over time. When I had five kids under the age of 10, my purpose, my mission of purpose for being here was not the same as it is now. I had five kids under 10. That was my purpose and my mission, raising those five kids. Well, it's not now. They're already gone, right? So that purpose, mission, the reason I'm here might not be the same one it's always been. I don't not, I'm not sure. I'm sure there is somebody, but I don't think there are many people who said, my purpose and mission in life from the time I was five to the time I was eight was exactly the same. Right. Doesn't, that doesn't happen. That'd be very unusual, right? Very unusual. I've never heard of that. Maybe Jesus, short of him, you know, because he kind of got born that way. <laughs> but short of him, I don't know anybody else that happened to. I think we kind of discovered over time, and maybe it changes over time, because we're if we're an instrument, if we're a tool being used for that purpose, well, you're a different tool now than you were 50, 20 years ago. So you can be used for different things than you could then. Where, where do you think the line between leadership and mission gets confused? What do you mean? Well, it, just as we were talking there, it kind of just struck me. And it's like, you know, there's this, the mission, like, what am I here to yep, do? Yep. What What is, and I, and I, hate, I, I really struggle with this word purpose, but yeah, like. Yeah. Me too. That's why I switched it to mission. Yeah. So it's like. You know, purpose sounds like you're supposed to know. And mission sounds more to me like I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah. And some kids get so stuck yeah. or, well, not kids. I don't know what my purpose general, is. I don't know what my purpose yeah, is. Well, and then me, they, then, me they either. then they think still, there's something still wrong. still don't know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but, but then there's this, the leadership in, and I guess like, you know, where the, where we get in our lives, especially business owners, where it's like, okay, like, you know, there's mission and then leadership inside your business or inside your identity, right? The leadership who, you know, my leadership as a, as a father or a mother, my leadership as a, as a business owner, you know, my leadership as position is a, in a, in a community, w whatever it is that we're pursuing, whether it's in your, in your church, um, there sometimes can be conflict, I think. Like, I, well, I was just, it, I, well, I don't actually have a thought about it. It was really the question was, because as we were talking, it's like, hmm, is there a conflict between mission and leadership where we get stuck in leadership and our identity of what we should do? Yeah. And, and this kind of just relates yeah, no, to I maybe agree. how you got sick. Well, like when you got sick, it's like, hmm, was there a flip or a switch where it went, holy fuck, like I was spending all this time working on the business or working on my kids or working in the community or working on my contribution or whatever, wherever it is and, and taking that leadership role. And then I got somewhere along the line, I realized, holy man, I've been confused with what I should do in, as a leader versus what I, what I want to do my mission, with my yeah. mission. Yeah, It I, just struck me. I sir, didn't. I, sir, sir, I, think, I think that probably is true. 
And, you know, I know you've done a lot of personal work about ego and, you know, what that means and all that. And I think that gets tied into those two things. The mission has no ego. The mission is stripped of all ego. It's easy to get ego in leadership. It's, it's actually almost impossible not to, right? Because you're almost forced into it sometimes, right? And so, and so I think that's, for me, kind of the separation that happened to me is I realized that the true mission had nothing to do with ego and what I should be and what I should do and all of those kinds of things. It's all that's left after all that is stripped away. This is, this is the actual humble me that's left after I take away all I should have been and all I should be and all even what even I think I should be. When I can't be any of those things, who's left? And that, that, that me is the actual real me underneath of all that. Because all that got layered on as we got older and as we got more careers and as we got more educators, well, that kind of got layered on. But the real you existed when you were five. And you didn't have any of that in the way. And so I think that it, it, this is a, that's a very esoteric conversation, a very deep conversation, but it is important because the only real you is the person. And I talked to you about a book um, a couple months ago, I think called uh, the new earth by yeah, Eckhart. And he talks a lot about this kind of idea in the book that, if you think about, so if we're, if we're present with each other in this moment and I'm a hundred percent here and I'm not doing anything else and you're a hundred percent here, and you're not doing anything else. And we're just in this moment, nothing else matters. That's the real us. Nothing else, nothing else. As soon as I have to go do it, as soon as I said the word have to, that goes away, that goes away. Because the only real us is the present moment right now. That's the only true real us. And we've lost that because we always have so much that we lose the sitting and looking at some leaves. That was the real you. That wasn't about who you should go help, how you should go do a thing. That was just you and the leaves and God. And that's the only you. That's the only you after all that gets stripped away. If you can't do anything because you're laying in the bed and you're hooked up to a machine and you can't go anywhere and you can't do anything, that's all that's left. That's the us we, some, we lost somewhere along the way. And so I tried to remind myself to bring that me back, which I read that book. Um, Steve actually recommended that book to me. And it's, it was changed, that was a life changing book because it, find, it kind of put words to what I was already feeling. And um, so I was, I was in Belize actually listening to it. And I went and sat on the, I still remember this moment. So I'm in Belize. We have a place there. Absolutely beautiful. We live on a beach, you know, boats. I got kayaks. I got all this stuff. I was there for three months this year. And I took this one day. And I went down to the, where the waves were coming up on the beach. And I, like you at the least, and I just sat there and I looked at those waves for a minute. This was kind of a thing from the book. And I just looked at the waves, and I watched them come in. No, I listened to them. I watched them, and I listened to them. And absolutely nothing happened except me watching those waves and listening to them for about 15 minutes. And I remember that 15 minutes better than anything else out in the three months. Hmm. Isn't that weird? That is. That's, yeah. Because I was 100% present not thinking about anything else. I forced myself to only think about those waves and the sound they made as they came up on the sand. All the things I did for that three months, that's the 15 minutes I remember the best. It's interesting. I just, I wrote the question down, like, because I, I mean, obviously I- And look how I, much you remember the leaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was nothing, mm -hmm. except it was everything. But everything. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wrote the question down and, and I think that this is just actually may sum up a little bit of our conversation here, which is, is like, the question I wrote down is, where's the slash my, where's the conflict or where's my conflict between leadership and mission? 
what we've been talking about is your six pillars, which you know we'll find, and and then like we've been talking for two and a half hours. Have we really? <laughs> yeah, yeah Holy we've been talking shit. for two and a half hours. So I got you won't call. shut up. We're gonna take a break, and then I don't even know if because we, we haven't even talked about business yet. No, no, we, we, dude, we, we were supposed so, to be only doing business. We were gonna. Yeah, we haven't even got to business. Yeah, we have a business. This is a business. Uh, it's called the business of doing business. Oh shit! Sorry, guys. <laughs> so, well, well, let me let me assure you of something. I love what you're about to say. So I'm going to say this before you, because I want to end with what you're about to say. You are your business. There is no such thing as your business. There's only you become a better you and you'll have a better business. That's true in your life. It's true in my life. So everything we're talking about is probably the most important thing you could do in your business. Sorry, you become a better you. And your business becomes a better business. If you want a better business, become a better you. That might be a great lead into, I don't know what we're going to do here. We're going to, um, we're going to take a break. You didn't even tell me I'm, what we're going to do. I'm, when we started. I have I'm, no idea what we're going to do. The I, next yeah, thing know. might be. It's like we were working out in the gym this morning and, and Pam said, what are you guys going to talk about? I'm like, I don't know. I don't show up with any questions. So uh, I had no preconceived <laughs> two, notions. Two, two and a half hours later, we can probably do another two and a half hours on business. Maybe we will. Maybe, and relationships. Maybe. Well, and then we have a relationship. <laughs> one. So you guys, you can see how deep, like, like Tim is a, 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 a deep thinker, but he's a great person. I mean, dude, I, I love you. I'm, I'm, I'm so appreciative of this time, two and a half hours. So I'm going to leave on two things. One, which was, what we've been talking about, you know, to put a bumper sticker on this is that, you know, we really kind of started talking about, hey, we don't start our days till 10, which I learned from you, 10 a.m., whatever that looks like for you. Maybe it's in the afternoon, maybe it's in the morning, maybe whatever. Maybe you have young kids, you have to get to school, so that doesn't work out for you. That's fine. You just got to sort it out. Whatever you gotta, your thing is. You got to find out the th what is the thing and then how do you source it, which I think, you know, jumping on to... Your website, living every minute. Living every minute. Sorry, livingeveryminute.com. Getting the the day planner, which would be very useful if, if you guys don't have a form or process or function of being able to execute on this kind of thinking. But this is a really perfect example. Is like at the end, you know, we're having this conversation, and and I go, well, where is my conflict, or where is the conflict between leadership and mission? And that's a great think time it's a question. Great think time. That's a deep conflict question that is going to take you across the line to stretch your thinking and stretch your brain. But at the end of the day, you know, the perfect bumper sticker is like from how this applies, what everything we've been talking about, which is really nothing to do with business and everything, everything to do with business, because this is a great quote, you know, you become a better you and your business becomes a better business. And that is no true words have ever been spoken. Thanks for listening. I appreciate you being with us. If you found value in the show and know a friend or a coworker who could benefit from the conversation, please share the link via text or on social media. Remember, each share creates a ripple effect of knowledge and inspiration. We'll see you next week. The views, information, or opinions expressed by guests during the Business of Doing Business podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of Dwayne Kerrigan and his affiliates. Dwayne Kerrigan, or the Business of Doing Business podcast, is not responsible for and does not verify the accuracy of any of the information contained in the podcast series. The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. Listeners are advised to consult with a qualified professional or specialist before making any decisions based on the content of this podcast.